talk about uh, the history of experimental music, certainly not a comprehensive um, history of it, but what is it that I mean when I'm saying experimental music? Now, of course, there's, there's no clear definition, um, and what I find is perhaps a better question that answers that question is, what is music? Um, the most basic definition of what is music is that it's organised sound. And if this is the case, then I'm very happy this is a broad enough definition for me. But uh, then another question arises, which is how organised is this sound? Now, over the many centuries, particularly in Western Europe, and I am really dealing with you know, the kind of Western European canon here, this idea of organisation has meant that the sounds themselves are very clear and defined. Notes are made of pitches that are um, a collection of sounds or tones that are in neat and organised mathematical relationships to each other. Um, and then these notes are added in further mathematical relationships to each other uh, to create what we think are accepted harmonic combinations. And these notes are generated by instruments that have been carefully designed so that they are um, very good at producing these combinations of tones. And um, the whole idea of extra noise and, and um, unwanted tones, um, we try and minimise that as much as possible in the way that we make those instruments. Now, if we add to this that these pitched tones are grouped together in evenly timed and countable compartments, um, we get metric rhythm. And um, both these factors of um, clearly identifiable pitch and clearly countable rhythms means that this kind of music can be easily notated um, and then it can be replicated by other performers with you know, reasonable accuracy. And for centuries, for centuries these are the, um, this is the idea of organisation that, that was known as music. But what happens by the time we get to the late 19th century and early 20th century is that people begin to question this, this sense of organisation. Maybe this, there are more ways that sounds can be organised. One of the clearest challenges to this is seen at the turn of the 20th century with the Italian futurists. Um, mixed in with some dubious politics around war and fascism, they were very interested in confronting, you know, all aspects of art and society, but in particular within sound, um, they were interested in confronting the idea of what sounds were allowed to be included in music. And the futurists were particularly excited by modernization, by industrialization, uh, and they wanted this new sound palette of machines to be included into this new world of music. So one futurist, a painter called Luigi Russolo, wrote a manifesto, The Art of Noises, in 1913, um, in which he called for an expansion of the orchestra, which by then was already starting to use quite a lot of dissonance, um, but still within this 12-tone scale, basically. Um, he basically suggested that the orchestras were trying to approach this level of cacophony of the new world, but they weren't ever going to reach it unless they started using these new sounds. So he constructed a range of instruments called intona rumori um, to perform this new set of sounds for, for music and, and wrote a, a number of compositions for it. Um, for example, these instruments, um, they were mechanical boxes basically and, uh, and he categorised them into different sound types like buzzers, gurglers, burstler, bursters, shatterers, thunderers, whistlers, snorters. Um, now, interestingly though, he was still very intent on um, keeping these sounds tamed and shaped within the predominant musical system. He says, we want to score and regulate harmonically and rhythmically these most varied noises. Um, so he was still working within the perceived framework of orchestral music, just saying, here's a few extra sounds that go with it. Um, and of course, the ways that he could produce these sounds at that moment in time were still very mechatronic. They were kind of using aeolian or wind-based uh, methods or vibration or friction. But as the 20th, 20th century progresses, the possibilities of how we can use real-world sounds opens up with, with technology. Um, of course, the major technology here was phonography and the invention of the, rec the record and recording. Um, but of course, you know, this technology in terms of how um, it was still quite restricted in who could do the recording. Many people could do the listening, but who could do the recording? 
Um, so then the biggest shift really came with magnetic tape, um, which was refined by the German military during the Second World War and became more available, um, particularly to radio, uh, radio studios and things like that by the late 1940s. Um, and of course, add to this the growing familiarisation with radio as a broadcast medium and also with film scores, the fact that um, film would now incorporate actual kind of sound design along with uh, music um, by the time films were starting to, you know, have, be talkies. Um, all this kind of uh, allowed um, real world sounds to begin to um, manifest as, as an actual musical form. Now the leading pioneer of this was the uh, Frenchman Pierre Schaffer, um, who established several studios and developed a theoretical framework around the practice of using real world sounds, which was he called music concrete. Um, there were other people that were also starting to dabble in this area, but um, Schaefer actually, uh, he, he kind of really theorised about this as an actual form of music. Um, he uses the term acousmatic um, for the sounds in which, uh, in which they are separated from their actual source. So once you make a recording, that sound no longer belongs to that um, physical object, yet it in itself is a concrete, uh, a, a concrete object. And, um, and these were then collaged and compiled together with some kinds of effects. Um, and we're talking mainly tape by this stage, so they're actually being physically cut up and, um, and stretched and spliced and put together. And he formed this electronic me electronically mediated form of music called music concrete. At the same time, in Germany, we have pure electronic music, which is being generated um, from actually you know, manipulating electricity, from manipulating the signal itself and generating the signal. Um, the classical composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen was particularly involved in this. Um, and so while part of this was about making the purest tone possible, in combinations it actually means that the musical palette is, has been expanded astronomically. And of course there's no discussion about um, experimental music without mentioning John Cage, who you know, could be said to have redefined our idea of what music is. John Cage was trained as a composer and even worked underneath um, Stockhausen. But his intention was to free music um, from the, even from the constraints of intentionality. Um, he, he wanted composition to, to occur kind of generatively of, of, its, of its own accord. So he used chance methodologies uh, and he created frameworks and time structures and sometimes rules and, and, um, and actions, but essentially he was letting the sounds organise themselves within these set time structures. His most famous example would be 4 minutes 33, in which um, no sound was deliberately made. Originally it was performed on piano, but it can be performed on any instrument. Um, and here the, the movements were um, marked by the opening and closing of the piano lid, yet no actual sound was performed by the pianist. Rather, the audience was asked to listen to the world around them and actually frame that as the musical composition. So from that very brief paddle down the tributary of experimental uh, music history, um, we see a sense of experimentalism as a, as a constant expansion of the idea of what is organised sound. Um, one in which what is acceptable sound is challenged and new sounds are found and incorporated and new structures begin to evolve as to um, to this expanding the, the range of activities that can be called music. Um, so of course this is the 21st century and all this history exists, yet there's still a predominance of um, the metric harmonic versions of music as what is acceptable as music and what is known as music. And so for want of a better term, experimental music ends up being um, a kind of grouped together combination of activities of musical practices that don't fit into the mainstream um, and that are always challenging what the mainstream might think music should be. So in the Australian scene this includes improvised music 
and from this I'm, I'm not meaning um, uh, jazz, I'm meaning a kind of non-metric improvised music. Noise, um, a range of kind of harder rock versions to um, kind of more academic electronic noise based music. Um, and a range of incestuous electronic genres, which is kind of where I classify myself, that don't really fit into the pop music genre, nor into academic computer music, nor into contemporary classical um, music traditions. So uh, a while back I was asked to edit a book called um, Experimental Music Audio Explor Explorations in Australia. And, you know, my conclusion as to what experimental was, was at its most basic level, to be experimental is to continue to keep asking the question, what is music? So given that little rundown of history, I am the first to admit that my practice is not wildly experimental, um, although it's challenging enough to not really fit within a kind of pop beat based electronic music. Um, and it doesn't really fit within the contemporary classical notated world of things, although there's, you know, there's some kind of crossover there. Um, certainly the ways that I work um, explore this act of listening that arises directly from this historical lineage. And the key really is this idea of the act of listening. Um, in my practice I'm always seeking ways in which to make the listener more aware of this act of listening, to, to really position themselves within the oral realm and question what, this, what, what they're perceiving, how they're perceiving, um, and, and what this perception then does to, to the act of listening itself. Um, the British composer Cornelius Cardew says in his essay Towards an Ethic of Improvisation, informal sound has a power over our emotional responses that formal music does not, in that it acts subliminally rather than on a cultural level. He's essentially saying that we listen differently when we don't know what's going to happen next. In harmonic and rhythmically focused music, it's all about knowing what will happen next, like where the melody will go and when the beat will drop. And I've found a little bit of scientific justification to this, or I've adapted this, um, from an article in New Scientist, um, which was researching musical hallucination at um, Newcastle University in the UK. Um, and it provides some neurological background as to the act of listening and, and why I think um, listening to sound as opposed to listening to music makes you listen in a different way. It suggests that our brain doesn't process every single sound completely. Messages go to the primary cortex, which is the lower part of the brain, um, and rather than passing on all this information up to the higher part of the brain, which would take a lot of processing power, uh, the, the higher centre just gets a little bit of information, a partial message, and then it predicts what will happen next. And it sends that prediction back down to the lower part of the brain and it's cross-checked. And if this is generally right, then that's fine. That act of prediction continues. It's only getting partial information. But if the prediction is wrong, then the full information needs to be passed back up and the brain centre has to go into a complete analysis of it. Um, so it seems that somehow we're getting our predilection for harmonic progressions and anticipation of rhythm and beat um, because our brain is wired to leap to conclusions. So with this in mind, the way I try and compose is to create a combination of known and unknown elements, some sections of harmony and melody and rhythm that are interrupted and intertwined with the unexpected and awkward and, and strange sounds that are difficult to place and difficult to understand you know, exactly where they come from. And through this struggle with the expected and the unexpected, the mind has to engage more and it has to basically listen more deeply. It has to actually be in the moment following the sound as it progresses without just guessing where the sound's going to progress. So this brings us to the idea of figuration and abstraction in my work. Um, now I'm using the word figurative in the way that it's used in visual art, as in relating to or representing um, a shape or form from the real world. And for me, the figurative is the known, it's the easily anticipated. Um, the abstract is the non-representational, the non-referential. Um, it offers no meaning except its own existence. And sometimes this abstraction can be generated from 
intense fragmentation or micro detail of something that is real. But by the time you hear it, that extraction is complete and it's unidentifiable. And it's this, this is the element that is surprising, the, the ill-fitting that always keeps us conscious and in the moment. Um, of course, in, in music in general, like the music itself is abstract, but if it's always in a relation that we understand is going to happen, then we're, we're lulled into this sense of, um, of easy anticipation. So this figurative and um, abstract binary is mirrored by another, which um, I kind of call seduction and repulsion. I don't want to alienate the listener completely, which is why I don't make hardcore noise music. Um, I basically want to lure them into the listening experience by giving them something that they might understand and anticip anticipate and then interrupting that with harsher noises and offset that with, with uh, ideas that they weren't expecting to find within this kind of music. And it's this kind of rupture that opens the listener's ears to the full spectrum of the sound and shatters the complacency of the listener in the moment. Uh, so then the question is, how do I do this? And this is where I'm going to show you some practical demonstrations.